As chapter 25 opens, uh, we're given the sad news of the death of God's faithful prophet Samuel. Uh, The impact of his death is going to echo throughout Israel and certainly affect the heart of David. You can almost feel the sadness in David as we read in verse 1 that he rose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. While he's down there, we're introduced to a wealthy man named Nabal. His name literally means fool, and and he's going to live up to his name. There couldn't be a more mismatched couple, by the way, than Nabal and his sweet wife, Abigail. She's described here in verse 3 as discerning and beautiful. Her later actions are going to reveal that that she has a love for God as well. Now, David and his men have unofficially, they've been protecting Nabal's shepherds, according to verse 16. So David eventually sends messengers to Nabal asking for some food as, as payment, but Nabal insults them and implies that David is a traitor to King Saul. And let me tell you, that doesn't sit well. In fact, David tells his men here in verse 13, every man strap on his sword. Think about it. David has refused to kill Saul, but now he's going to wipe out an entire clan because he's been insulted. David has handled some pretty big tests in his life, but he's about to fail in this smaller test. When Nabal's wife hears that David is marching toward their home, she just springs into action here in verse 18. She loads up donkeys with 200 loaves and two skins of wine and five sheep already prepared, clusters of raisins and cakes of figs. Now, when she intercepts David and his army, Abigail delivers one of the most tactful speeches anywhere in Scripture. In verse 25, she admits that her husband is a foolish man. She then urges David not to take matters into his own hands. And then she says here in verse 30, When the Lord has done all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you prince over Israel, you shall have no pangs of conscience for having shed blood without cause. In other words, David, God has great things planned for you. Don't ruin it all over my foolish husband. Well, David is impressed and humbled, and he turns back. When Abigail returns home and the next day she tells her husband exactly what had happened, he has some kind of stroke. And 10 days later, verse 38 tells us he dies. Well, not long after that, David proposes marriage to Abigail and she agrees. Uh, But before the wedding's barely over here in chapter 26, Saul is now after David all over again. One night, David and two of his men sneak into Saul's camp to see what's going on. And and once again, David can easily kill his chief enemy who's fallen fast asleep. But instead, David just takes Saul's spear and water jar and leaves. And then he says here in verse 11, The Lord forbid that I should put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. Now, once David and his men reach a hilltop some distance away, David hollers out, wakes up the whole camp, and informs Saul of what just happened. And again, Saul here makes a show of an apology. But this time, David isn't fooled. He knows Saul isn't going to give up. In fact, as we come to chapter 27 now, David David is exhausted. David is discouraged, and he decides to go back to the Philistine city of Gath and hide out. Now, David makes this decision without talking to God. I think, frankly, he's tired of running. He wrongly assumes that that God has left him. Maybe he's gone on vacation somewhere in the universe. And verse 2 tells us that David and his men go to Achish, king of Gath. Now, you might remember the last time this happened and David showed up here, he had to act like he was insane in order to escape. But not this time. The king knows that David is running from Saul, and he assumes that David and his men have defected from Saul and Israel's army. So here in verse 6, Achish gives David the town of Ziklag to live in. And from here, this town of Ziklag, David and his men will conduct raids over the other enemies of Israel, all the while telling King Achish they're fighting against Israel. 
David is, he's playing with fire here. This is dangerous. Chapter 28 now opens with the Philistine army gathering for a major campaign against Israel. And King Achish, uh, well, he expects David and his men to join him. We're going to learn later on that in God's providence, the other Philistine generals are going to oppose David's participation. This is probably going to save David's life. Now, at this point, here's what's happening. Saul gathers his army, and verse 5 tells us that Saul was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. So, in desperation, Saul seeks guidance from the Lord. That's unusual. But God is silent, and we would expect that. Uh, Saul hasn't listened to God for years. Why would God listen to him now? Well, Saul tells his servant here in verse 7, Seek out for me a woman who is a medium that I may inquire of her. Well, this is in direct defiance of God's command back in Leviticus chapter 19. Mediums and necromancers were those who who sought to make contact with the spirit world, the dead, in, in order to get information about the future. Well, Saul disguises himself as he goes out to meet this witch, essentially an occultic practitioner living here in the village of Endor. At first, she doesn't recognize Saul. She reminds Saul that mediums are forbidden in Israel. Well, she's afraid she's going to be turned in. So Saul tells her here in verse 10, as the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. You know, isn't it fascinating that Saul uses the name of the Lord even though he's defying the Lord? Well, Saul tells this witch, this medium here in verse 11, that he wants to make a a, a spirit connection with old Samuel. And she goes through the motions to her total shock, which is interesting. Samuel makes an appearance. Well, Saul steps forward to try to explain what's going on to Samuel in verse 15. I am in great distress, for the Philistines are warring against me, and God has turned away from me and answers me no more. Therefore, I have summoned you to tell me what I shall do. Well, this is a really strange event here, isn't it? Some have sought to explain it away by, you know, saying, well, this was deception or sleight of hand or maybe even a demon masquerading as Samuel. Now, I think the best explanation is to take this passage at face value. Samuel actually makes an appearance, as the Bible says. God allows this to take place. And it's to this witch's surprise. (laughs) She didn't have any power to make this happen. Well, why would God allow this? I believe this is not only a moment of vindication for the prophet that Saul has ignored for decades, but this is also a moment of revelation. There is indeed life after death. And God alone, not some medium or witch or anybody else, has the power. He's in control of that afterlife, that spirit world. Well, Samuel's final words to Saul are found here in verse 19. Tomorrow, you and your sons shall be with me. The Lord will give the army of Israel also into the hand of the Philistines. You notice that Samuel never answers Saul's question about what he ought to do. He tells Saul what God is about to do. The cold, hard truth that he and his sons are going to die the next day causes Saul now to collapse. He falls down, not in repentance, by the way, but in terror and fear. Beloved, every single day, millions of people are consulting horoscopes, mediums, palm readers. Why? They're desperate for answers about the future. But just like King Saul here, they are rejecting the Lord of life. They're rejecting everlasting life with him. They're rejecting his word that he's given to us. So they're eagerly pursuing any knowledge they can, everything but the knowledge of the gospel and the truth about Jesus Christ. What they need to do and what we invite them to do, maybe that's you today, is to fall to your knees and repent of your sin and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ before it is forever too late.
Well, with that, we're out of time for today. Until our next wisdom journey together, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.